All right, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, general pharmacology. Um, as an EMT, there are medications that you can administer. Uh, they would be patient prescribed medications that they have themselves, uh, with the exception of some over the counters that you can carry, um, you know, in your bags. Um, so we'll talk about those. Medications that might be on an ambulance include aspirin, uh, oral glucose, oxygen, which is actually considered a medication, and activated charcoal. Uh, most services um, that I'm familiar with have removed the activated charcoal. There are a variety of reasons, and when we do talk about the activated charcoal, I can explain some of those. Now, aspirin is administered to patients who are having chest pain that you suspect is cardiac in nature. Um, we know that it's cardiac in nature because doing our patient assessment for pain, we use the OPQRST mnemonic. And depending on the answers that the patient gives us, if the onset was sudden, if they were shoveling heavy snows or snow or carrying the weights to the attic, if they described it as a crushing substernal chest discomfort that doesn't get better with um, position or isn't made worse when they take a deep breath or when you push on their chest. They rated it a high number and it's been going on about 45 minutes. When a person describes their discomfort like that, that's highly suspicious for heart. And so aspirin is something that we would consider giving uh, a patient uh, who's having heart-related chest discomfort. Another uh, medication that you could give would be oral glucose gel or oral glucose paste or even an oral glucose chewable tablet. Um, there are 25 grams of sugar in each one of those uh, tubes of oral glucose gel, and that is enough sugar to raise the patient's blood glucose level should it get dangerously low as a result of taking their insulin and not eating properly or not getting to eat at all uh, or uh, working much harder than they normally do. Now, oxygen is a very powerful drug. Uh, we used to think that oxygen didn't hurt anybody. In fact, there was a, a time where you could actually go to an oxygen bar and have a cannula put into your nose and have scented or flavored oxygens administered. Uh, and people believe that that would make them feel better. Uh, in patients who need oxygen, we certainly should apply it. But if they don't need it, then uh, we shouldn't give them oxygen because... Uh, oxygen is a very unstable molecule. It likes to bind with other molecules in the body and form substances like hydrogen peroxide or nitric oxide or superhydroxyl radical. And these compounds that are formed when a patient doesn't need oxygen and you give it to them uh, are called free radicals or oxygen free radicals. And they have a tendency to destroy healthy tissue. Another medication that could be given in, in the presence of uh, somebody who had um, poisoned themselves, either unintentionally or intentionally, is activated charcoal. Uh, activated charcoal is um, essentially just charcoal. Uh, briquette charcoal, burnt wood, ground up into a slurry or a, uh, more of a slurry. Uh, they call it a suspension because if it sits on the shelf for a long period of time, the water separates from the um, charcoal, so you have to uh, shake it up before administering it. It is jet black. It is gritty. Um, most people, when given activated charcoal, will uh, throw it right back up. Uh, activated charcoal neutralizes or binds with many of the harmful chemicals or drugs that a person may overdose on uh, and allows it to... Uh, be removed in the normal stool. Uh, bronchodilator inhaler or a metered dose inhaler, an MDI, is certainly something that a person may have if they have, uh, you know, chronic respiratory problems. Uh, they're often called rescue inhalers. 
they ca contain a um, uh, they contain a medication like uh, albuterol, uh, atrovent, you know, those sort of things uh, that help dilate the bronchioles so that a person having an allergic reaction or having an asthma attack can breathe easier. Um, prescribed medications certainly include those meter dose inhalers. That has to be a prescribed medication. Uh, nitroglycerin is a prescribed medication. And if the patient has their own nitroglycerin, you as an EMT can certainly assist in administering it. Uh, we don't carry as an EMT nitroglycerin on the ambulance. Uh, epinephrine, uh, you can administer epinephrine depending upon where you live. You may be able to draw it up and give it as an IM injection or an intramuscular injection like a shot. Uh, but in most places, uh, epinephrine is administered through a auto injector or an EpiPen. So bronchodilators are used in patients with asthma, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and when you breathe these uh, bronchodilators into your lungs, uh, the medication allows the bronchioles to dilate. Uh, one of the side effects, however, of using a bronchodilator inhaler or a metered dose inhaler is that it does increase the heart rate and it does make the patient feel a little jittery, particularly if they take more than one dose. And oftentimes, if they're having trouble breathing, they're having an ac active asthma attack, you know, those sort of things, um, they may have to take more than one dose or take repeated dose 10 or 15 minutes apart, which may increase their uh, amount of jitteriness. Uh, nitroglycerin is, again, prescribed for chest pain. It comes in a spray or a pill bottle. Uh, the nitroglycerin pills are in a brown bottle. Uh, that is, uh, for a reason, nitroglycerin, when exposed to light, uh, light deactivates nitroglycerin, air deactivates nitroglycerin. So the longer it sits out in the light, the longer it sits uh, on a table or on a bedside or somewhere where it's exposed to light and air, uh, it, it degrades and loses its strength. Um, nitroglycerin is taken by patients who have a history of chest pain. Maybe they have a disease called angina pectoris, which literally means chest pain. And we'll talk about angina when we discuss cardiovascular emergencies. But in a person who has angina, they will be prescribed nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is a smooth muscle dilator. So when taken under the tongue, nitroglycerin dilates the coronary arteries as well as all arteries, the arteries in your head, the arteries in your arms and legs, the arteries throughout your body. They all dilate. So one of the contraindications of giving nitroglycerin is if the patient already has a low blood pressure because nitroglycerin, by dilating the blood vessels, is going to make the container or the cardiovascular system larger. So it's going to be less full and the pressure in the system is going to drop. <clears throat> you also shouldn't give nitroglycerin to patients who take uh, medications for erectile dysfunction, whether it's Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, or any other similar erectile dysfunction drug, uh, because those drugs also dilate vessels. And when you um, uh, use those drugs in conjunction with nitroglycerin, you get a greater effect uh, than each one individually. Uh, so uh, the container can, uh, or the cardiovascular system, the blood vessels, can dilate a lot, uh, causing the pressure to, to drop to a dangerously low level. That could even cause cardiac arrest. Now, we often think that only males, males take drugs for erectile dysfunction, particularly Viagra, uh, but women take Viagra as well. Uh, they take Viagra for migraines. They take Viagra for uh, pulmonary hypertension. They take Viagra to improve their orgasm. Now, one of the side effects of giving nitroglycerin is that it is going to drop your blood pressure. So we only give one dose of nitroglycerin, and then we reassess their blood pressure. And if they're still having discomfort, we can give another dose five or five minutes later. Uh, reassess their blood pressure, and if it's if it's above 90 uh, or if it's okay, then uh, we can go ahead and give a second dose of nitroglycerin. So as an EMT, you can give up to three doses of nitroglycerin 
five minutes apart as long as the blood pressure remains above 90 millimeters of mercury. Now, epinephrine, uh, epinephrine comes uh, in a what's what's now called an auto injector. Uh, this one happens to be a uh, twinject epinephrine uh, auto injector, and it's actually a pediatric one because the dose that it would administer would be 0.15 milligrams of epinephrine. Uh, you twist the cap off, you press it against your uh, thigh. Uh, when you press it against your thigh, <coughs> uh, it um, releases a needle that uh, shoots in through your clothing right into the muscle, uh, and then you have to hold it there for a full 10 seconds so that the epinephrine can be injected into the muscle. Um, when you pull it away, depending on the type of device, the needle may self-sheath and be covered up, or the needle may be exposed. So you have to be very careful not to poke yourself with that needle. Epinephrine is prescribed and used for patients who have severe allergic reactions uh, that are classified as anaphylaxis. Um, one of the things that epinephrine does is that it does vasoconstrict. And by vasoconstricting, it helps keep the blood pressure up in patients who are in anaphylactic shock. But epinephrine also dilates the smooth muscles of the airway. So like a breathing treatment, epinephrine is going to uh, dilate the um, bronchioles that typically constrict during an anaphylactic reaction and allow the patient to breathe easier. And the vasoconstriction that occurs from giving the epinephrine is going to keep the blood pressure up. Epinephrine or adrenaline also is going to make your heart beat faster uh, and stronger. So that's going to help keep your blood pressure uh, normal as well. Uh, other drugs that sometimes may be administered um, by a, a EMT, uh, certainly depending upon where you live, uh, one is naloxone or Narcan. Now, naloxone is an antidote for a patient who is unconscious and in respiratory failure after taking a narcotic like heroin or oxycodone or hydrocodone or any sort of codeine or morphine derivative. Uh, it does not work in patients if they have not had a narcotic. Uh, naloxone is a narcotic antagonist. Uh, it reverses the effects of the narcotic, uh, allowing the patient to uh, breathe and uh, maybe even wake up. Um, there are some force protection medications as well. Um, uh, what we mean by force protection medications, uh, there are Mark IV kits or Duodote kits that are prescribed in the likelihood or the event of a, of a uh, deadly nerve agent attack. Uh, if we had credible evidence that there was going to be a deadly nerve agent attack in Iowa, uh, there are caches or storage uh, facilities where these auto ejectors are kept. They could be quickly um, dispatched uh, to all providers so that if uh, a deadly nerve agent attack occurred, the provider could use the atropine auto injector to treat themselves or their peer. Uh, there isn't enough medication to treat actual patients, but you would be able to treat yourself uh, and be able to continue taking care of patients. Now, drugs are, are listed by their generic name, uh, but really each drug has at least three names. Each drug has a chemical name, each drug has a generic name, and each drug has a brand name. Uh, one or more trade names given to the drug by a manufacturer is the brand name. So as an example, acetaminophen is the generic name. The brand name is Tylenol. Uh, ibuprofen is the generic name. The brand name is Advil. So there are different um, generic names and brand names of medications. But what you need to know as an EMT when you're giving a medication is what is that medication indicated for? 
We know that aspirin is indicated to help platelets from sticking together during a heart attack, so it prevents clot formation. We know that oxygen helps is indicated for hypoxia. We know that glucose is indicated for low blood sugar. We know that naloxone is indicated for narcotic overdose and that nitroglycerin is indicated for patients having chest pain. We also need to know the contraindications as well, or when are these medications not supposed to be used? As an example, nitroglycerin is contraindicated in patients who have a low blood pressure. We need to know the side effects of the medication. And again, I'll go back to nitroglycerin because one of the common side effects of nitroglycerin is low blood pressure. So if the blood pressure does drop, we would expect that after giving nitroglycerin, but we don't want it to drop so low that it becomes problematic for uh, the patient. Now, an untoward effect uh, is similar to a side effect, uh, only it's something that uh, could be detrimental uh, to the patient. Um, medications come in a variety of um, uh, types, I guess. Uh, they can be compressed into powders or tablets. Uh, they can be in liquid form. They can be in gel form. Uh, they can be suspensions that need to be shook in order to mix everything up. They can be a fine powder that may be inhaled. Uh, they can be a gas like oxygen, and they could be a sublingual spray like nitroglycerin. Now, administering or assisting medications uh, that a patient has is a very serious responsibility as an EMT. Uh, you need to know the medication, and you need to use good judgment or critical thinking. You need to know what the indications, contraindications, and side effects of the medications that you're allowed to uh, assist a patient with are uh, so that if a patient has a particular condition and is, as an example, if a patient has heart-related chest discomfort and is already prescribed nitroglycerin, as long as their blood pressure uh, is okay and they've not taken any erectile dysfunction drugs in the last 24 to 48 hours, you could assist them in giving their nitroglycerin, knowing that you have to pay close attention to their blood pressure. Um, as an EMT, you work under the auspice of your medical director, uh, and the same is true when it relates to giving patient-assisted medications. Now, there are two types of medical direction that we work, we work out of. Uh, one is called offline medical direction, and that's where you don't actually speak to the physician, but you use standing orders or you, or you use protocols. Now, online medical direction requires you to speak directly to the physician or the physician designee. Now, when that occurs, when you have online medical direction where you have to listen to the physician, You'll give a patient report. You may actually request giving nitroglycerin, or the patient may order nitroglycerin. When the patient, when the uh, or the physician may order uh, you to assist the patient with their own nitroglycerin. If that occurs, you need to repeat that order back to the physician, so that it's clearly understood uh, that the uh, dose is correct, the route is correct, and if you're unsure, certainly ask for clarification. Now, when giving medications, uh, we're going to do a good job and be safe when we follow the five rights. Do I have the right patient? And oftentimes, that's really not a big problem in EMS because you only have the one patient. Is it the right time to administer this medication? Uh, what we mean there is you may administer it once, but... Uh, as an example, with nitroglycerin, you administer it every three to five minutes. So you need to know, has my three to five minutes passed? So it's now time to administer the medication again. And then is it the right medication for this patient? And is the dose correct? Most all the medications that we give are in single unit doses. In other words, you just give one nitroglycerin pill because it is a single dose or when assisting somebody with a breathing treatment or their meter dose inhaler, they just get one puff of the inhaler, you know, those sort of things. And then am I giving this medication by the right route of administration? Now, most all your medications that you'll give as an EMT 
a nitroglycerin is going to be sublingual. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, aspirin is going to be oral. Uh, Narcan is going to be intranasal up the nose. Uh, oxygen is going to be, you know, through a cannula or a mask. Activated charcoal is going to be oral. So knowing the route that these drugs can be administered is important as well. Um, so drugs can be oral or swallowed. They can be sublingual or dissolved under the tongue. They can be inhaled or breathed into their lungs. They can be intranasal or sprayed into their nose. Or they can be intravenous or injected into the vein. Now you as an EMT are not going to be able to start IVs or inject medications into a vein. They can be given intramuscular or injected into a muscle like your EpiPen. They could be given subcutaneous or injected under the skin, and that's not a, a route that you as an EMT could do. They could be intraosseous or injected into the bone of the marrow cavity, uh, and then it gets into the bloodstream from there. And again, that's not within your scope of practice as an EMT. And lastly, drugs can be given endotracheally, uh, sprayed directly into an endotracheal tube inserted into the trachea, and that's not within your scope of practice either. Some things to consider is that well, the pharmacodynamics of a drug, and the pharmacodynamics is the study of effects of medications on the body and what effect the medication will have and how will this medication affect my patient. Patient-specific factors change how medications work. In other words, um, if I have a patient who's taking um, a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker or both of those medications, and I give them nitroglycerin, uh, it, it, uh, uh, it may drop their blood pressure even more. Or if I give them... Uh, an EpiPen, if they're taking a beta blocker, uh, it may not work very well at all. Uh, so we need to know what uh, the specific patient factors are as well, uh, especially uh, any medications that they may be taking. Um, let see here. Reassessment and documentation is important as well. Once you administer a medication, it's important to reassess the patient and then document the medications, how they were administered, what the patient's response was to the uh, medication, what their vital signs were after giving the medication, particularly when you're giving a breathing treatment or nitroglycerin or epinephrine. We would expect those conditions that required you to give the medication uh, improved. Their shortness of breath improved, their chest pain improved, uh, their allergic reaction improved after giving these medications. Now, there are a lot of herbal agents that are out there as well, and certainly uh, people will take these over-the-counter herbal agents to treat a variety of, of different problems. And this chart, or table 16-2, does a good job of addressing some of the more common herbal agents and what they may be taken for. So you can read... Uh, uh, the chart, and you yourself may be taking some of these. Now, remember, EMTs administer aspirin, oral glucose, and oxygen as part of patient care. You may assist with prescribed inhalers, nitroglycerin, and auto-injectors as well. <coughs> you should understand the names, the indications, contraindications, and side effects of medications that they intend to administer and you must have appropriate authorization to give a drug and follow the five rights of medication administration, and that'll keep you out of trouble. Reassess and documentation are important elements of medication administration as well. You want to be able to, to validate or prove that um, the patient is getting better. Now, certainly some patients will not get better uh, even when they're given their uh, properly prescribed medication, so keep that in mind too. All right, so uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, wrap this uh, lecture up and uh, move on to the next talk. Uh, you know how to get a hold of me, so uh, have a great day or night, depending upon what time uh, you're listening to this lecture.